All right, open your Bibles to James, James chapter 4. We're just going to be looking at the first 10 verses together. James chapter 4 will be in the first 10 verses. As we've been walking through James, we've been talking about the marks of uh, spiritual maturity and genuine faith. Uh, as we talk about these marks, my prayer is always there an encouragement to you. I pray they are a challenge to you in terms of where you're at in your walk of spiritual maturity and, and whether or not your life is marked by spiritual maturity in regards to your faith. And um, as we've been walking through these marks, I always like to review them. In chapter 1, uh, some of the marks that we talked about that I pray are evident in each of our lives is being joyful in trials, victorious over temptation, that we would be doers and not just hearers of the word. In chapter 2, we talked about loving one another in an impartial way. We talked about the mark of a faith that works. Faith alone saves. But a faith that saves is never alone. In chapter 3, we talked about a tongue that is tamed. We have a control over our tongue. Last time we were together, we talked about wisdom. Not worldly wisdom, but godly wisdom and walking in that way. Well, today we'll talk about another mark and we'll talk about overcoming, overcoming conflict. How to overcome conflict in our church in our marriages, in our families, and how to make sure conflict doesn't go unresolved so that it turns into bitter fights and wars among us. What does it look like to overcome conflict? And so James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, we'll be reading to verse 10. It reads this way. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members... You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So we're going to talk today about the mark of overcoming conflict. Overcoming conflict so that it doesn't go unresolved. Because what ends up happening with unresolved conflict is it eventually evolves into wars and fights that we may find among us. And so if I could give us a few ways the text really instructs us on that. The first is this, uh, overcome conflict in our churches, in our families, in our marriages, or in any relationship by means of self-examination. Self-examination. James, throughout this letter, he often asks questions of introspection. Questions of self-examination. He did that in chapter 2, verse 14, when we were talking about faith. Uh, can a man have faith? If a man says he has faith but doesn't have works, does that faith save? The answer to that question is no, because that's a dead faith. It shows no evidence. Faith alone saves, but a faith that saves is never alone. So James asks concerning faith, he says, examine it. If it shows no evidence, then faith without works is dead. It cannot save. You can say you have faith, but if you have no evidence and there's no signs of life, that faith isn't genuine. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 13, he asked a question of introspection concerning wisdom that we talked about last time. Who is wise and understanding among you? The answer to that question for all of us as believers should be, I'm wise. Why? Because I'm, I follow the Spirit of God and the Word of God and how it guides and directs my life. And so James continues, chapter 3, verse 13, to say, well, show it then. If you are truly wise, then, then demonstrate it in how you walk in the wisdom of the word and not in the wisdom of the world. Now he asks another question of introspection and in verse one says, where do wars and fights come from among you? So we're supposed to s- consider that for a second. 
Where do they come from? When you fight, when you war in the church, when you fight or when you war in your marriage, when you fight or when you war in any relationship, where does that come from? Now, as you consider your answer to that question, I want to just consider three observations about the question. And the first observation is the reason for the question. The reason James asks, where do wars and fights come from among you, is because James knows that these churches are known for their wars and their fights. Isn't that a sad thing? Jesus said in John chapter 13, 35, I believe, he says, he says, this is how they will know you are my disciples, by your what? Your love, one for another. But unfortunately, too many churches are known not for what unites us, but what divides us. We're not known for our love that's supposed to unite us together. We're known for our fights. We're known for our wars. We're known for those, that unresolved conflict that's not dealt with in a, a godly manner. There's no forgiveness. There's no mercy. There's no grace. And the same thing that we've received from God, we're not willing to give it to anyone else. And it always reminds me of the story of the guy who was on a stranded island and he was on there for two years and no one found him. And then he was on there all by himself. And then finally, after two years, they rescued him. And they took him and they had him on the airplane. And the guy who was rescuing him turns to him and says, were you the only guy on the island? To which he responded, yeah, it was only me for two whole years. Pretty lonely. He says, well, what were those three huts that you had there? He said, well, the first hut was my house. The guy said, well, what was the second house? hut? He says, well, that was my church. And he said, well, what's the third hut? Well, that's the church I used to go to. That's unfortunately too common for us, right? Churches are often known for their splits, are often known for not what unites them, but what divides them. And, and when we have unresolved conflict, it can go one of two ways in a church. We can either resolve it, and that's the right way, the godly way, or we can fight, we can war. We can allow those unresolved conflict to evolve or just leave the church and then go fight and war at another one. And so that's what ends up happening a lot of times. You go from church to church and you say, they've got a problem. You go to another one, they got a problem. And it's always a reminder, once you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll really mess it up, right? Nobody's perfect. And often there are going to be disagreements, there's going to be conflict, but the instruction that we receive in the word is how you deal with that conflict. And so first, the reason for it is because James knew that they're having a hard time getting along. How many of us have a hard time getting along with others in the church, in our marriages, in our family? In general, because of sin, as we're going to see in, in a moment, our sinful desires, we often have trouble getting along. Secondly, the kind of question has to do with not just disagreements, but unresolved conflict. And that's what I want to really focus on right here, because it's one thing to deal with conflict in a church, in a, in a marriage, and in a family. It's another thing to allow that conflict to go unresolved in an ungodly way, so that it evolves into wars and fights. This is a reminder, like when you think of various scriptures, when you think of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 to 27, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give a place to the devil. Why? Often we take a text like that and say to our married couples, don't go to bed angry. Why? Well, because if you're going to have conflict, you want to resolve it that day so you don't have to have the bitterness of it tomorrow, right? Right? And that's true for any relationship, any conflict in our lives. We shouldn't go to bed angry. We shouldn't allow the anger and bitterness to evolve and turn into fights and wars. And eventually it gets out of control where I just hate that person. Why? Because it's unresolved. So when James says, where do wars and fights come from among you? He says, where does this, all this unresolved conflict come from? Where you can't deal with it. Where it goes on not just for the day, but for the week, for the month, and then you've got 10 years of conflict in a marriage. You've got years and years of conflict in a church that goes unresolved and people are sitting on different sides of the aisle simply because there are wars and fights among us. There's a reason whenever we come to the Lord's table, uh, when we come to worship, when it comes to communion, that the scriptures are very clear. If you're going to partake of the Lord's table in a worthy manner, in an honorable manner, because it's holy, we should make sure we get right first before God. 
and get right with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because that conflict should not go unresolved in the church. And if it goes unresolved in the church and we partake of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner, scriptures say that's why some of you are sick and some of you sleep. What does it mean sleep? People are dropping dead because of it. God takes worship seriously and that's true for that. And so um, the kind of, of question we're talking about here is unresolved conflict. And then thirdly, the purpose of the question, where do fights and wars come from among you? The purpose is to reveal our level of spiritual maturity. How you and I answer that question will tell us a lot about where we are at spiritually. Whether we are more spiritually mature or less spiritually mature. Let me say, put it this way. How you and I respond to conflict in the church, in our marriage, in our family, or in any relationship will tell us a lot about where we are at in terms of our spiritual maturity. And so let me put it this way. When I'm in a war or I'm in a battle or I'm in a fight, when I ask the question, where do wars and fights come from among you? How would I usually answer that question? I don't want you to answer it right now in your, you know, your sanctified mode, right? Like, I want you to think about when you're angry, when you're at war, when you're fighting with someone. It don't matter if it's the church. It don't matter if it's your spouse. It doesn't matter if it's a family member. It doesn't matter if it's any relationship. Where do fights and wars come from among you? You know how I'm going to answer that question, unsanctified answer? That other person. I am not responsible at all. Like, if you want to know why we're fighting, why we're warring, you go talk to that other person. They're the problem. And that reveals a lot about our hearts. That reveals a lot about our level of spiritual maturity. So James asked the question for us to examine our hearts, to examine our lives, and then he goes into another question to answer the first question. So where do wars and, and fights come from among you? James says it this way. He says, in verse um, 1, do they not come from your desires? Your desires for pleasure that war in your members. So where does it come from? James doesn't tell us that other person. He says it comes from each of our hearts. And he tells us in each of our hearts there is a battle going on. There is a war going on between our old nature, the flesh, which now has no power over us, and the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to say no to the flesh. When someone hurts me or commits an offense against me, my flesh wants revenge. I don't just want revenge. I want to stab him in the back and then twist it. That's what I'm talking about. But the Spirit says, no, if he slaps you on one, one side of the face, give him the other one to slap, okay? And so we're, we're, we're talking about the flesh and we're talking about the Spirit. So the heart of the problem when it comes to conflict is the problem of the heart. How many times in Scripture do we see that the heart is the, the problem? When it came to temptation, if you remember back when we were in chapter 1, verse 16, where does the problem come from? What am I tempted by? And a lot of people blame the devil. The devil made me do this. The devil made me do that. You don't even see it in James. The devil didn't even mention, even though the devil has a part to play. He's the one dangling it in front of you. Your fleshly desires are what deceive you and I. They deceive us into thinking that stolen waters are sweet when the reality is they are not and we partake of that lie. We are deceived, we disobey, and disobedience brings, what, death. Our hearts are deceitful. And that's not just true when it comes to temptation. That's true when it comes to conflict. And so what is the heart of the problem? The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And so verse 1 tells us, where do wars and fights come from? Do they not come from your desires that war in your members? How do those evil desires, desires for pleasure, express themselves? Verse 2, it says, you lust and you do not have. Okay, what is lust? Lust are desires. And you can have good desires or you can have bad desires. Sinful desires are godly desires. When we're talking about lust here, we're talking about desires for what I want. That's the ultimate source of the problem. Why is conflict unresolved? And why does it evolve into wars and fights among us? Well, because I want what I want. And it doesn't matter what it'll cost me. I want what I want so much that I don't care if it'll cost me my marriage. 
I want my way so much that I don't care if it will cost me my church. I don't care if it'll cost me my friendship. I don't care what it'll cost me because I want my way and my will so much I don't care because I value me and my will over everyone else. And so I value my way over my marriage. I value my way over my church. I value my way over my friendship and anything else in my life. And the Bible says you lust and you do not have. In other words, you think your way is going to bring you ultimate satisfaction and joy and contentment. And James says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, no, you will be left unsatisfied and empty. If you've ever followed the desires of your own heart and you've received what you so wanted in your marriage, my way or the highway, I don't care what it costs me, it leaves you dissatisfied, discontent, and it leaves destruction and ultimately death in the path behind you. Uh, I was listening to a, uh, an interview with a basketball player who's now in his 50s or 60s, but he, he's not even a Christian, but he said this. He said... Um, I learned a lesson of when it comes to contentment and satisfaction early in my 20s because I had all the money I, I wanted to buy whatever I wanted. He was saying, you know, when you're young, you think to yourself, you know, what, what's going to bring me joy, satisfaction, and happiness is a big house, a big car, and I can buy whatever I want. You know, I, I got all the money in the world to give to people whatever they want. And he said, at 23, I had everything I wanted. I had a big house. I had a big car. I had more money in the bank that I could know what I was going to do with. And he said, I was unhappy. I was discontent. He was like, I was so happy I learned that lesson when I was 23. Now, I don't know. I don't think he's a believer. He could be. Nevertheless, he's not even a believer, but he learned that lesson very early on. It's a reminder, you can get your way, you can get your will, but in the end, you will be dissatisfied. And so it's always a good idea if you're like, you know, I do want my way, and I want my will. I'm not interested in following the word. I'm, follow, I'm interested in following the world, and I'm going to follow my feelings and my flesh. Now, take a moment to talk to someone wiser than you. And one of those people might be someone who made a mistake and made that mistake that you thought you would be the best for your life. And then you talk to them and, you, and they let you know, listen, that path led to destruction and death, dissatisfaction. It didn't bring me joy. It brought me just sadness. And that's the biggest mistake of my life. So you lust. You desire what you want, but you don't get it. Not only do you lust, verse 2 continues to say, you murder and you covet, but you cannot obtain. You say, I, I am not capable of murder. Oh, your heart's so deceitful. You don't even know what's in it. If you get pushed the right way with the right buttons for the right amount of time in the wrong situation, in the wrong place, the ultimate expression of hate is murder. And what ends up happening when hate is not dealt with in your heart and you don't deal with it at the cross. You don't ask the Lord to change your heart. Ultimately, hate will never be satisfied until it reaches the point of murder and you take the other person's life. You say, I'm not capable of that. And don't you ever dare tell me, oh, your heart is deceitful above all else. You don't even know what's in it or what it's capable of. But ultimately, hate's ultimate expression is murder. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. In other words, you're left unsatisfied. Even if you get what you want, you end that relationship. That, that church dissolved. That church is, is, uh, is split. Or that marriage is dissolved. Or, or that relationship, that friendship is no more. You know, in the end, it doesn't bring you any satisfaction at all. When we talk about murder, when you think of the first fight in Scripture, ended in murder. You know that? Cain and Abel. Let me read that to you. Genesis Chapter 4 says this, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. What a wonderful thing to have two children. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. 
So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desires for you, but you should rule over it. Verse 8, now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, jealousy, bitter coveting and envy, when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Bitter jealousy and hatred fully expresses itself in murder. You say, I'm not capable of murder. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 5, 21 to 24. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Encourages us to take, as we talked about the Lord's table earlier, seriously. Like it tells us to take it that much seriously. Like the Lord takes that so seriously. Do you remember when the Lord asked Cain, hey, Cain, where's your brother? He said, am I my, am I my brother's keeper? Excuse me, Cain? The hatred in his heart has evolved to such a point that there is a disregard for the authority of God and he says, am I my brother's keeper? As if God will not hold him to account. God holds us to account. And we're reminded, hey, you can murder, you can covet, but even if you get what you want, you're not going to be satisfied. Text continues, you lust, you do not have, you murder and covet, but cannot obtain. You fight and you war. We said fight and you war is unresolved conflict. You don't resolve the conflict. You go to bed angry. You allow that, that, that anger to evolve into bitterness and your heart becomes hardened to the point that you say, I can't do anything wrong. That person is the only person who can fix this because they are the problem. What a hard heart we find ourselves with. Text goes on to say, you do not have because you do not ask. So our sinful desires express themselves in a number of ways, in our lust, in our uh, in our murdering, in our coveting, in our, in our unresolved conflict, but also in our prayers. This is interesting. So sinful desires express themselves first in prayers that are absent, and secondly, prayers that are sinful. The text says, you do not have because you do not ask. When you want your way so much, and you want your will to be done so much, you don't even want to turn to God in prayer, and your heart becomes hardened towards it. Here we come to a place and said, you know what? Prayer just doesn't work. That's why I don't pray. Well, prayer doesn't work the way you or I want it to work. The way I want it to work is, Lord, when I pray for something, you give it to me, and you give it to me when I want it. But God, the relationship he offers us is not a relationship with the genie in the bottle where you rub him the right way three times and then he gives you your wishes. No, the relationship God offers you and I is as a heavenly father. And as a heavenly father who loves us and cares for us and wants the best for us, he's not going to give us the desires of our heart or the desires of our flesh. He's going to give us what's best for us. I love my children. And because I love my children, I don't give them everything they want. And I don't give them it when they want it. Because if I did give them whatever they wanted, when they wanted it, ultimately that would end in some kind of abuse because, or neglect because I'm letting my children follow their own path. But as a good father or as a father who desires to be good, I'm not going to give my children everything they want. And so our heart becomes hardened with these sinful desires to the point that our prayers lives are just absent and we don't even pray. But not only that, you don't have because you don't pray. Secondly, you pray, but you don't have the right prayer request because you're not praying according to his will or his word. You're praying according to your fleshly desires and the desires of the world. And you think God's going to give you everything. God, if you love me, you'll give me whatever I want. No, no, no. Because he loves you, he's not going to give you what you want. 
you look back on some of those prayer requests where you said, Lord, this I really believe is your will for my life and I believe this is my will for my life and then you look back on it and you're like, thank God you didn't give me that. Thank God you corrected me in that. You, you, you allowed me to wait for that or you didn't give me that and so it's a reminder when we ask sometimes, we ask with the wrong desires. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So, just in these first three verses, how do I overcome conflict? How do we resolve it before it evolves into, into fights and wars? Well, self-examination. Uh, examine your heart. Examine your answer to that question. Like, in terms of conflict, where does it come from? Am I blaming other people? Or am I taking responsibility for myself? Am I holding myself accountable? You know, even if you think, you know, that person, they are to blame. They are to blame, really. Really? You might be thinking that right now. If that person didn't do this or wasn't so hard about that, you know, this would actually work out. And you come to a place of saying, hey, God's been so gracious and merciful and kind. While I was still yet a sinner, Christ died for me. How much more if I truly understand the grace of God and the mercy of God and the extent of the love of God, if I have truly understood it, it would make sense that I would also give that to others out of an overflow of my love to God for what he's shown me in terms of love. If I could just give us some practical ways that looks like, first is, is this, um, examine yourself. I, I put here, check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's a good way to put it. Check yourself before you wreck your, your church relationships, your marriage, your family, your friendships. Check yourself and first examine how you, how you respond to conflict. So I want you to ask yourself a question. Do, do you resolve it quickly or do you allow it to, to continue to, to evolve into bitter wars and, and fights? Do you go to bed angry? You have a choice tonight because there might be something on your heart, an unresolved conflict in a relationship, it could be a marriage, it could be a family, it could be uh, in the family. I don't know what it is. But the question is tonight, are you going to go to bed angry? And are you going to wake up bitter? You have a choice to make. You say, I don't know if I can even take the first step <laughs> to even talk to that person or ask the Lord to examine my heart. Well, in a moment, it's going, he's going to tell us he gives us more grace. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Oh, this is so good. If you need grace, not just for yourself, but to extend it to others, I want you to know your heavenly Father who provides you all the grace you need and more. Your cup runs over. But he also provides you the grace to extend to those who need it. And so examine, examine how you respond to conflict. Do you blame others? Do you take personal accountability? Secondly, examine your heart for sinful and selfish desires. Examine your heart. What are the desires of my, do I want my own way or do I want God's way? Do I want what's best for my family or my church or do I want what's best for me? Because what's best for me is my pride. What's best for me is that I'm, uh, I'm the one who, who gets what I want every time. no. What, what may be best for you may not be best for the marriage, for the family, or for the church. And so I need to humble myself in the sight of the Lord and allow him to work and move. I, I, wanted to, I got this from Tom Rayner. He's got silly things church members fight over. We fight over silly things. Uh, number one, ar these are real arguments. Argument over the appropriate length of a worship pastor's beard. Okay. Number two, fight over whether to build a child's playground or to use the land for a cemetery. You know, what do you do? These are true fights, real, real fights. One deacon accusing another deacon of writing an anonymous letter and deciding to settle the matter in the church parking lot. Another fight, a fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. <laughs> an argument on whether the church should allow deviled eggs in, at the church meal. That's an interesting one. Um, some church members left the church because one church member hid the vacuum cleaner from them. It resulted in a major fight and split. Man, petty stuff. And then number seven, a disagreement over using the term pot luck or pot blessing because we don't believe in luck. So, I mean, silly things churches argue over, but silly things we 
argue over. I want you to think, like, if you're married, if you're in a family, think back to the last argument, and sometimes you look back at some of the petty things we argue about, and you think to yourself, man, why did I spend my time arguing about that instead of just resolving the conflict, moving on, and enjoying our time together? How many know when you have unresolved conflict in a marriage, like, and and you're going to settle it later that night because you're like, I'm not going to go to bed angry, it just ruins your whole day. You just waste the entire day because you're upset with the other person when you could have just resolved it. And that's why I can't, I can't understand how folks can go years without dealing with unresolved conflict in the relationship, in a church, in a family. You just continue. It becomes the norm. Or you just continue on with it. And the Lord gives us <coughs> scriptures, and we're going to talk about in a moment how to resolve those things. And so examine how you respond to conflict. Examine your heart for those sinful and selfish desires. Thirdly, examine your prayer life for consistency and content. Your sinful desires will express themselves in an absent prayer life or a sinful prayer life where you pray outside of God's will and outside of God's word, where you have a hardened heart towards the Lord and say, you don't give me what I want, so I'm not going to pray to you. That sounds a bit childish, doesn't it? If your child tells you, no, I, I'm not going to talk to you because you're not giving me candy for breakfast. Excuse me. That, I love you. That's why I'm not doing that, but I want you to talk to me. It sounds pretty childish. Examine your prayer life. If I could um, open up for discussion, the first is this. What are common threats to the unity and harmony of the, the local church? Common threats to the unity of, the, the, of, a, of a church, of a family. We talked about silly fights, but what, what are those threats for us? What do we need to guard against when it comes to harmony and unity? Church or, or family or marriage, anything? Yeah, Frank. Yeah, so not submitting to God's design for the leadership, certainly. Understanding. Yeah. Miscommunication, misunderstanding. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of fights are over something is because you're not understanding where somebody's coming from or where their heart is. And um, the other person, I know that me, a lot of fights are because I don't feel like somebody's listening or understanding oh, yeah. me. So it's about understanding. It's yeah. About yeah. Yeah, I'm hearing communication and being able to listen. Because I, I think when we're fighting and warring, I want to get my, my side across to you, but I'm not too worried about hearing yours. And that's why they continue. And so if we'd listen, and then we would respond and affirm what they say, not necessarily agree with what they say, we can have good communication. Communication is a big thing, yeah. Actually talking about it, resolving it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I want them to understand where I'm coming from. I have to, I have to first understand where they're coming from so that they feel that they're being heard, so that they can... I need to set aside my ego and hear them to allow them to set aside their ego to feel safe, to listen to them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I get that completely because it's... If I'm not willing to give them what I want, you know, what's the point? If, if, if I'm not willing to listen to them, I've got to be able to willing to listen to them for them to listen to me. Sure, certainly, yeah. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah. Here. My preference is the most important thing. Yeah. My preference is the most important thing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Preference. Yeah, so harmony um, is brought by denying yourself, your preferences, your desires, your fleshly pursuits, taking up your cross, keeping your eyes on the cross and following after Jesus because our preferences can get us off track of the main mission and it's Christ. It's knowing him, making him known, sharing him and we, we fail at being effective disciples when we're so distracted by our preferences or our fleshly desires, yeah, yeah. It's a good reminder. Anything else we need to guard against? Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, gossip and when somebody tells you something in confidence, especially when you're building rapport with that person and um, keeping that between you and that person. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Unforgiveness. It's a big one. Yeah. Not, wi- not being willing to let go and forgive the offense of others. Yeah. How can we pray strategically for the unity and harmony in our church, in our marriage, in our families? How can we pray strategically that the Lord would protect harmony, unity, and a one-mindedness about the truth? Do you pray for unity? Yeah, Steve. So seeking his glory and seeking, putting him first in all things, yeah. It's not about me. It's about him. Protecting his reputation, yeah, we can pray that. Amen. Anything else? Anything else we can pray strategically for? How about our marriages in particular? How can we pray for the marriages of our church to protect unity and And I, I think it's so important to be reminded we need those things and we need to ask God for them. We need God's mercy, not just for ourselves, but to extend to others his grace, his discernment, his love, his forgiveness. We can't do it in our own power. Yeah, amen. And so uh, how do you overcome conflict in the church, in a marriage, in a family, in any relationship, self-examination, examine your heart, examine your life, Examine that question. How do I respond to it? Do I blame others? Do I take personal accountability? Where do wars and fights come from? Secondly, not just self-examination, but personal accountability. Personal accountability. James moves forward through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he holds these believers to account. And he doesn't mess around. Can you imagine me coming up to somebody who will not forgive someone else? Says, hey, listen, I will not forgive that. I will not show mercy to that person. I will not be gracious to that person. I will not, I will not, I will not. I want my way. It's not my fault. It's the other person's fault. And this is what James accuses them of in verse 4. He says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, accuses the believers who are unwilling to resolve conflict in a godly manner. He calls them adulterers and adulteresses guilty of spiritual infidelity. He says, you have not been faithful to me. So the fact that you and I will not extend love and grace and mercy to someone else is not because we do not love them. God's, James, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says it's because you don't love God. He says, your devotion and love for God is divided. And so you want your way so much 
that it is affecting your relationship with the Lord because if we have really been forgiven, we'd be willing to forgive. If we've really been shown mercy, how much mercy have you and I received? Well, we deserve hell an eternity without God and his people forever and ever. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, spiritual death, an eternity without God and his people forever and ever. And God says, you deserve hell, but I've given you mercy. I don't give you what you deserve. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I'm also going to give you grace. And guess what? Don't only, not only do you get out of hell, you get into heaven. You're an adopted son of mine. You are a recipient of an eternal inheritance. You are a child of the living God. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Now I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And then I'm unwilling to extend that to someone else. And the real question is, am I really being faithful to God? And James says, here, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you are an adulterer or adulteress if you follow the ways of the world and not the way of the word. If you are unwilling to extend the same grace, mercy, Love that God has shown us, an unconditional love, an unrelenting love. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? What does it mean to be a friend of somebody? A lot of times we, we have shared interests, right? I'm friends, we have similar personalities, similar likes. We do things together, isn't that what we do? And so when you're a friend of the world, you don't follow the wisdom of the word, you follow the wisdom of the world. And what the wisdom of the world says is if someone hurts you, you hold on to that offense. Not only do you hold on to it, you seek revenge. You don't forgive them no matter what because they don't deserve it. They don't. But I didn't deserve his grace and mercy either. So thanks be to God that I received it so then I can extend it. And so when we're talking about the ways of the world, we're talking about unforgiveness. We're talking about selfishness. We're talking about covetousness. Anything that allows unresolved conflict to evolve into wars and fights and continue in that direction is the wisdom of the world. And God says, if you follow that path, you are an, a, a guilty of spiritual infidelity. You have been unfaithful to me. But if we know the scriptures, because Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul. There's one God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We talked about this on Sunday a little bit. When it says there's one God, it means there's not a plurality of gods where we divide our love and devotion to multiple gods. And because there's one God and one God alone, I give him all my love. I give him all my devotion. I give him everything. So I cannot say to the Lord, listen, you have my whole worship in my life and you're Lord of my life on Sunday but Monday morning is a different story it doesn't work that way you can't say God you've got 99% of my time but I want 1% you know it doesn't work that way my wife and I we're coming up on an anniversary tomorrow nine years can't believe it we made it to nine years almost we'll see tomorrow <laughs> and can you imagine if I turn to my wife tomorrow we're gonna go out I turn to my wife and say, out of all the women I love, I love you the most. What? No, that don't work that way, right? I can't tell Mirde, of all the women that I love, you're my favorite. No, no. If I truly love her, I'm going to give her all of my love. You know, I can't say to Mirde, listen, uh, 360, 360 days out of the year, that's pretty generous. You have my love, my devotion, but a few days out of the year, I want to be with another woman. Oh, she would leave me, like, right? It, wouldn't be, it, would, it would be unfaithful of me to do something like that. And ultimately, the text is going to say, I become an enemy of my marriage by participating in infidelity, right? Because I'm not looking to, 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 to make sure our bond lasts forever. I'm looking to cause some kind of dissension within there. Same thing with God. If you become a friend of the world, you become an enemy of God. Very black and white and very convicting. And it's easier said than done, at least from my perspective, because when someone has hurt me or offended me, especially in a very personal way, 
And I feel that anger. I feel that bitterness within me. It's difficult to say, I'm going to forgive that person. I'm going to surrender it to the Lord because I desperately need his mercy and his grace to extend it to that person. Even in my conversation with that person, right? If you've been there and you're like, man, oh, I really, they're really hard to love. They're really a difficult person. Or maybe you've been there and other people say you're a really difficult person to love and you're really difficult to get along with. And God really teaches me mercy, patience, and grace when I have to love you. But it's a reminder if God's given it to us, we can give it to others. And he gives us the power to do it. Verse five, or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? In other words, we're told that God's jealousy is for us in the sense that he desires our fidelity, 100% of our loyalty and our commitment. He wants 100% of our devotion. And in the way that we express our devotion and love for God is how we treat brothers and sisters in Christ who sin against us. Not how we treat brothers and sisters in Christ who treat us right, but brothers and sisters in Christ who mistreat us, that's a real test of where I'm at in my level of spiritual maturity. That's a real test of whether I have a, a faith that is genuine and authentic and tested by fire or not, okay? And so the spirit who dwells in you, yearns jealously, verse six, this is a wonderful verse for us who think to ourselves, man, they're hard to love or it's hard to show them mercy. He gives more grace. Not just to you, but to extend to others. Do you believe that? I want you to think about that person who, man, they're difficult to love. They're hard to show grace and mercy to. It's hard to be patient with them. They really bring the worst out of you, right? They push the buttons. Do you really believe God gives more grace? Grace. Not only does he give more grace, God resists the proud, and we are proud when we refuse to, to extend to them what God has extended to us, but gives grace to the humble. And so personal accountability. If I could give us just one takeaway here, it would be this. Um, exercise accountability by admitting times when you have followed the ways of the world, not the ways of the word when it comes to conflict. If you've never confessed your sin to the Lord in terms of holding on to unforgiveness, holding on to bitterness, holding on to anger, holding on to uh, the, your way or the highway, right, sort of mentality, confess that before the Lord. Ask God to forgive you and ask him to give you the grace to change your life. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he's a new creation. The old is past, the new has come. He's given us the spirit of God who indwells us and he will enable and empower us to forgive, to show mercy and to love unconditionally the way that God has loved you and I. Um, so at this point, I wanted to ask this question. What kind of people are hardest to love <laughs> and how has God taught, taught you to love them, especially in the church? What kind of people, you don't have to name them, okay? But what kind of people are hardest to love and how has God taught you to love them in your life? Or is everybody just easy to get along with? Angry and critical people. Angry and critical people? Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. 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 People who are just negative all the time, backhanded comments, you think you can have a good conversation, and yeah. Difficult to love. Did I hear something over here? What's that, Don? Co workers. <laughs> what kinds of co workers, though, Don? Oh, yeah. So, kind of self centered and selfish and. Um, it's about them. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of what she was saying. I think people who are just unhappy in general are very difficult to love, but I always try to remind myself they're probably suffering. Yeah. They're unhappy or going through something personal and you don't know where they're going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're themselves in their shoes and they probably need to be loved more. Yeah. 
So unhappy people, and Jason's saying, a lot of times there's a reason for it. It might be suffering, it might be something in their past, and just thinking through that, that helps us extend love and grace. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Found somebody who can put up with you. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, um, egotistical and gossipy. yeah, yeah, egotistical, and gossipy, yeah, certainly, yeah, yeah, whispers, pss, 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 pss. anything else, hard people to love, and how you've learned to love them, what advice would you give to those of us who find it hard to love and hard to extend mercy and grace, what's helpful? Because this is common, right? I mean, it's hard when, it's one thing to hear about another situation, another thing to be hurt personally and to be hurt deeply. Often, it's those closest relationships that hurt the most, right? Because they, you would think they're the ones who care the most and know you the most and love you the most and know those soft spots in your heart and they're manipulating those things. So how, how do you love them? Pray for them, yeah. Yeah. When you don't know what else to say or do, pray for them, for God's best for them, yeah. Yeah, pray for yourself. Pray that God would give you the grace and mercy and love to extend to them, certainly, yeah. Forgiveness, really just deciding not to let your feelings get hurt mm. by that and, and acknowledge that there's probably, it's probably not about you. Yeah. It's something that's going on with them so we can get past that. Yeah, thing. yeah. So just displaced anger sometimes where people pour it out on you when it's meant, well, it's caused by something else. And just being reminded of that is, is helpful. Yeah. Sometimes knowing their background and all that, you can understand why they are, why they, how they are. Yeah. Yeah, understanding their background, getting to know them personally. Yeah. For me, I think personal accountability, it's good to have somebody you can talk to about those kinds of things, especially when you're in the situation, it's just you and them, and it's fre a fresh wound. I need someone like my wife where I can say, hey, get, set me straight if I need to be set straight, because there are times when I, uh, I might not be thinking in my right mind, might be following the flesh or my feelings rather than the word in this moment, and accountability is good. It's good to have those people in your life who you can kind of be transparent and open with. This is how I feel right now. Set me straight. It's good to have those open, honest Relationships. Anything else you want to share? Yeah. I think just the, the uh, realization of being obedient is more important than whatever they're slinging your way. Yeah. 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 Obedience is much better than revenge. It's much sweeter. Yeah. Even though it doesn't feel like it sometimes. Yeah. Harold. Yeah. But the obedience will create the feelings. Yeah. So obey now, even if you don't feel like it, and the Lord will provide you the right feelings later. Yeah. I always say orthodoxy is right belief, understanding the truth, right, right, right belief in the truth. Orthopraxy is, is practicing the right belief. So behavior based on that belief and orthopathy, I would say, are right feelings. Like you may not always want to open up the word, but you open it up anyways because that's what you need to do. And eventually you'll fall in love with it more and more. You may not always feel like forgiving, but the Lord, when you walk in obedience to him and you see the contentment and satisfaction it brings to your heart and your life, it's a blessed and joyful experience. If you won't seek revenge, but give God the, surrender the revenge to him and say, Lord, it's in your hands and you're the ultimate judge, it's a great place to be where you can just surrender it into the hands of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and know that he's going to take care of it. And so um, how do you overcome conflict by means of self-examination, um, by means of personal accountability, and then lastly, a life of repentance, a life of repentance. So if there was a major takeaway, this is what the text has been working up to 
Where do wars and fights come from among you? As we examine our hearts, examine our lives, examine how we respond to conflict, do we resolve it? Do we just allow it to evolve into wars or battles? And then um, we, get, we get held accountable by the word, you adulterers and adulteresses. Listen, you're not being faithful to God. If you don't extend the same love and mercy and, and, and grace to the other person, listen, are, are you truly, have you truly understood his grace and mercy and love? And now here's the, here's the best part. Text says this in verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. If you're experiencing conflict and you need to respond to it in a right way in a church, in a marriage, in a relationship, in a family member, submit to God. Submit to him. Surrender your life afresh and anew to him. You know, when we come to faith in Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we come before him when we confess our sins. We say, Lord, I agree with your word. I'm a sinner. Not only do I participate in sin, but I've got a deep-rooted evil in my heart that I inherited from my father, Adam. And it expresses itself in all kinds of ugly ways. I confess my sin and the fact that I'm a sinner. I was born in my mother's womb in iniquity, right? But I also believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He came from heaven to earth and he lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death, took my place, He paid my debt. He was buried, placed in the tomb. Three days later, he rose in newness of life, defeating sin, death, and Satan. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back again in glory as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. When we say, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, we are inviting the rule of God to come through the hearts and minds that have surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. How do we extend the kingdom of God? By sharing the gospel. And as the gospel is shared, people come to faith and they surrender their lives to the lordship of Jesus Christ. They receive forgiveness, but they say, now, Lord, my life is governed by you. I deny myself daily. I take up my cross and I follow after you. But I don't know about you, but I need to surrender my life first thing in the morning again. Because otherwise, my flesh and my feelings are going to direct the rest of my day. And if I don't surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ first thing in the morning, I know that's going to mess up my entire day. There are certain times during the day where I need to surrender again to the Lordship of Jesus Christ because there are different struggles that I might have or you might have. And we need to once again submit to the Lord. That, what's, it, what's it mean? Saying, Lord, I'm not going to follow what I want. I'm going to follow what you want. That decision isn't mine to make. This is what I want to do, but I won't do it because you're the Lord of my life. I don't sit on the throne of my life anymore. Right? And so you say, I'm not going to make decisions. Submit to the Lord. Align yourself under his authority. Align yourself under his care. You obey him, you submit to him. You're a slave of Jesus Christ. How many times do we hear that from Paul? He introduces himself, not necessarily as an apostle at times, but as a slave, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. As a slave, you don't have any rights. You obey your master completely. That is our relationship to our God. We don't have control over our life. Submit, submit. Um, the text continues. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. How do you resist the devil? Do you hold up a cross or do something like that? Well, the text continues. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I always say the best way to win the battle against the the devil and win every time is to never get in the ring. When the devil comes knocking at your door and he says, hey, uh, I want to talk to you. I want you to do this or do that. You say, I don't need to talk to you. I'm going to talk to the Lord to talk on my behalf. And so the way we resist the devil so that he'll flee from us is to draw near to God. You draw near to God and he'll fight your battles for you. The best way to fight your battles is on your knees. Because it's the significance of prayer is not what we're praying for, but who we are praying to. And when we know that the God of heaven and earth who has all authority and power over all things rules and reigns, when we surrender it to him, he can help us with anything. And so draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, 
you sinner. Now, now James really gets into it. James says you need to cleanse your hands and purify, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We need to come to a place of confession at times and say, Lord, the reason I'm unwilling to forgive or extend mercy or grace is because my heart's not pure, because my hands aren't clean, because I've been following my flesh and my feelings instead of the truth of your word. And I've not been walking in the wisdom of your word, but I've been walking in the wisdom of the world. And Lord, my mind has been double-minded. The Lord wants you to come to a place of alignment. Confession is simply saying, I agree. And so a lot of times when we come to a text like this, right, because it's, it's, it begins by asking the question, where do wars and, and fights come from among you? Over there. What's the first thing you think about when you hear a message that you're like, oh, this would be really good for that person? Or you're reading a devotional and you're like, oh, I can't wait to share this with so-and-so because they really need this. But what a reminder, like, when it comes to confession, where, where does this relate to me? How does God want to do some surgery on my heart today? What are those areas of my heart? Because his word is sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces the, the deep parts of our hearts that we thought we were better than we were. And so, um, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Then it talks about having a contrite heart. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. I'm going to ask a serious question. Um, we all sin from time to time. We're still in this process of sanctification, being conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. If right now, like all of my sins this past week were played on the screen, maybe some of you wouldn't want to talk to me, but at the same time, I probably wouldn't want to talk to you either. And the reminder is we're in this process of being sanctified, conformed to the image of likeness of Christ. And every day my prayer is I look more like Jesus today than I did yesterday. We're, we won't reach sinless perfection until one day we are glorified. But, but praise the Lord, Lord willing, we are looking more like him every single day and we're sinning less and less. So I want to ask you this question. When's the last time you, you actually wept over your sin? When's the last time you, you were just completely broken over it, fell on your knees and cried out to the Lord, Lord, I've, I've missed the mark. I've fallen short again and again. I've sinned against you. I, I want, Lord, to, to, for you to break my heart for, for what breaks yours, Lord. Help me to see the error of my way. Let me not rationalize my sin, but let me hate my sin. Help me to consider the consequences of my way. The wages of sin is death. Yes, ultimately eternal separation, but destruction will follow you all the way. There are consequences to our sins. God may forgive them, but we see the sin that destroys our lives. When you take a look at Psalm 51, 16 to 17, David said this, for you do not desire sacrifice or I will give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a, a broken spirit and a, a broken and contrite heart. These, God, you will not despise. You know, there are times when we might have a false repentance. I'm repenting because I got caught. Or I'm repenting now because I see the consequences of my sin. But, but the real motivation for us should be our love for God. He should be our ultimate desire, the ultimate desire of our heart to give him all of our love, all of our devotion, and for us to participate in sin, in word or deed, action, affection, in any capacity, is to take away from his glory and our worship of him. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. When you read the sacrifices given in the Old Testament, they were to be without blemish. Like you, they could not have spot or wrinkle. And yet our bodies are living sacrifices to him. How much more should we be saying, Lord, purify my path, cleanse my heart, help me to walk with you and love you and serve you and confess my sins daily, repent of them, make me like you every single day. And so uh, feel remorse for your sin. The text continues on and says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight 
of the Lord and he will lift you up. The Lord opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If I could ask this one last question. In the heat of the moment when you experience conflict, which of these commands is hardest to obey? Submit to God. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. What, 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 what among that list is, is hardest? Lament and mourn and weep. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever done that. You know, I, yeah. I asked for forgiveness, but you know, yeah. I've had memory. I have a hard time remembering the list. Yeah. So, yeah. I know I'm dirty, but <laughs> yeah. I can't specify all my feelings. Yeah. I don't know that I've actually ever, you know, yeah. sat down or knelt down and wept. Yeah. Over my brokenness. Yeah, and the good thing about the weeping part, too, is he picks you up. He gives, he'll lift you up. As you get to that place of humility, he'll lift you up and remind you of his grace. Yeah, isn't it sweet? Yeah, so lamenting and mourning and weeping. Did you say something, Sandy? The humbling The humbling part, yeah. Well, that's the hardest part because our pride, it's not my fault. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Hardest part when you're in the heat of the moment. You ever been there? Yeah. Yeah. In Daniel, yeah. In chapter 6, uh, King Darius yeah. says, uh, he was greatly displeased with himself. Yeah. And he set his heart. He changed his heart. Yeah. And uh, he set his heart. And that's kind of what we need to do. Yeah. When we humble ourselves, it's an acknowledgement of being displeased with yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. having enough sense to know, hey, in this moment, I'm not thinking rationally, at least biblically, rationally. Yeah, 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 Jerry. I appreciate what you said about not stepping into the ring, because so often I think back in the complex that I've had, you, you, you find yourself in the wrestling ring. Oh, yeah. And you're just wrestling, and you're wrestling, and you're getting tired, and you're wrestling. After a while, you don't know what you're wrestling for anymore, you're just wrestling. And um, it seems like it's time Oh, yeah. As soon as you do, as soon as you walk Yeah. It's typically because of your flesh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Avoid the ring. Yeah. Avoid the ring. Just surrender it. And it's hard to surrender because we want to take it in our own hands. Amen. Well, let me close this in prayer together. Father in heaven, <clears throat> we want to thank you first and foremost for Jesus. Thank you for the love that we've been shown, unconditional love. Thank you for the abundant grace that we've been given, not spoonfuls, but buckets and buckets of grace. Thank you, Lord, for the mercy we have received. Uh, Lord, as we reflect on your generosity to us, help us, Father, in our relationships with one another, in our church, in our family, in our relationships. Uh, receive that grace, mercy, and love that you've given to us and extend it to others. Our prayer, Father, is that we would be marked by genuine faith and spiritual maturity. And the only way to do that is to deny our flesh and our feelings and our desires of our hearts. Take up our cross and follow after you, Jesus, no matter what it costs us. Father, may your glory be our ultimate pursuit. May our love for you and you alone be the ultimate desire of our hearts. Father, we come before you right now. And we confess sin, ways we've fallen short today and this week. And Lord, we just pray that you would give us a heart to, that would break for what breaks yours, that we would see the error of our ways and the destruction that it brings and how it breaks your heart, Lord, when we sin. And Father, may we in our humility be motivated to, to deal with our sin at the cross and may we receive you who lifts us up and reminds us that we are sons and daughters of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
the one who we will spend eternity with forever and ever. Father, help us to share this message with others as you give us opportunity. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.